don't know me, as you've just heard, I, I stepped up yesterday as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and I'm also an executive director at WSP, so um, professional services engineering consultancy that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, so in terms of the ICE, Institution of Civil Engineers, uh, we were established 202 years ago, so 1818, and we've got over 95,000 members cool. all over the world, all focusing in on the broad palette of infrastructure and the piece around generating benefit for society um, through the way that we apply our professional engineering knowledge. Um, so handily for today, my theme for the year ahead is net zero carbon and specifically the way in which civil engineers um, can help support the shift towards a genuine net zero carbon balance by 2050. Um, and I, I suppose that the key point that I'd want to start from is to say that it's quite easy and it's quite tempting, I think, to think that all of this change is simply to do with the mm. energy sector. And, you know, if we can just shift to renewables, we can tick the box, it won't be an issue anymore, and so on. Now, now there is there is some truth in that, and that clearly we do have to get through. Well, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Cool. <laughs> we do have to get through that transition. Um, but actually, in my head, it's not just about an energy transition, it's about a whole infrastructure systems transition, because actually the reason we need an awful lot of the energy that is currently being generated through non-renewable sources is because of the infrastructure that's out there. So it's because of transport, it's because of buildings, it's because of water, it's because of waste and digital and so on, all those different sectors they are the reason that we currently need all that energy in the first place. Um, so it depends on how you cut the numbers, but broadly speaking, roughly 70% of the world's carbon emissions currently can be traced back to infrastructure, which is a slightly scary statistic when you start to think about the fact that that, of course, is the primary driver of climate change across the entire world. Now, the UK position is slightly better than that because we have done quite well in terms of a shift towards renewable energy and there have been uh, specific improvements around waste in particular. Um, so one of the things that the ICE did um, oh, okay. over the yeah. last few weeks and months is to actually commission some... Well, I'm on call, so I can't hear anything. We've got people not on mute, haven't we? Never mind. <laughs> um, so then we, we commissioned some research over the recent uh, few weeks in order to really understand the latest position in terms of carbon emissions for the UK's infrastructure as a whole and whether or not we were on the right track. And the good news is that when we think about it from the period from 2010 to 2018, that brand new analysis shows that we have had some progress. So carbon emissions that relate to infrastructure have come down by 23% since 2010, um, mainly because of that shift to renewables and also because of improvements, as I say, in the waste systems side of things. Now that might sound fantastic, However, unfortunately, it is not nearly enough. Um, and what we need to do in the next decade is halve those infrastructure related emissions in terms of carbon emissions. We need to halve them from where they are now if we are going to stand any chance of getting on to the one and a half degree pathway, which the UN um, has specified is utterly essential if we're going to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So as I say, good progress from a UK sort of entire point of view, but not nearly enough, a massive amount still to do. So um, apologies for those of you who tuned into my presidential address uh, yesterday, but um, very quick reiteration of some of the key points there. To me, there are three key things that we all need to be doing in order to really get to grips with how we generate that level of change, how we halve those carbon emissions in order to get anywhere near the right kind of pathway. And the first one is that we absolutely have to understand what net zero carbon actually means, because it strikes me that we have an awful lot of people out there who throw the words around, and I'm sure present company accepted, that they, they throw the words around, it's on topic, it's a good buzzword, or three good buzzwords, they're all quite short, they're quite easy to remember, but actually people don't really understand what they mean. And so how on earth are we going to achieve net zero carbon if we don't know where we are, we don't know where we're going, 
and we don't know how we're going to get there. It, just, it strikes me that, you know, sort of sheer dumb luck is probably not a great strategy in terms of how we get there. So um, I'll, I'll come back to that one in just a second. But the other two key pieces in terms of action from now, and I guess this might flow through into some of the policy recommendations through this discussion, is that in terms of how we actually start to slow and then halt climate change, there is only one way really to do that, and that is absolutely to bring down our levels of carbon emissions, as I've been saying. Um, there is nothing else we can do that will dramatically change the position that we will otherwise end up in. Um, so carbon mitigation, climate mitigation, that piece around absolute reduction is the key. However, because we know we've got 30 years of worsening climate ahead of us at least, because of previous actions that are already baked in, which will take time to come through in our atmosphere, which we simply can't just sort of magic away, uh, we have to also think about climate adaptation. And so in terms of what that means specifically, region by region, country by country, clearly it's a very different picture depending on where you are and what the issues are, but we know we're already experiencing worsening effects in terms of you know, localised impacts of climate change. And as I say, we've got at least 30 years of those worsening impacts to deal with, even under the best case scenarios that we're talking about. So that is absolutely also a piece in terms of adaptation to those effects that we need to be thinking about. But none of those adaptation measures will do anything to actually fix the underlying problem. It's much more of a, I don't want to describe it as a sticking plaster because that's not quite fair, but it is it's only, that will only ever be an interim or a temporary fix to deal with something that we simply cannot build our way out of. So I hope that sort of makes sense. It, the carbon reduction piece is the utter priority, but the adaptation piece will also be important. Now, just coming back briefly to the piece around net zero carbon and, and what it really means. Um, one way that I've been finding works quite well to, to make sure we're all clear on what we're talking about is to think of it, it's sort of there's two sides to the coin, or, or you can think of it, uh, some of you may have seen it yesterday uh, as a sort of a, a bath effectively where we have a tap which is our emissions and, the, and what we're pumping up into the atmosphere and we have a drain or the plug hole which is the ability of the planet to cope with that level of emissions and if at any point if we are out of balance so if the water level in the bath is effectively rising it means that we are having an impact on the planet it means we are causing harm. So coming back to the point around infrastructure systems, what we need to do is encourage really rapid change in the way that they're used and the way they're operated. And certainly as we create anything new, we need to think really hard about the degree to which they could be expected to help towards that carbon balance instead of hindering or in fact making it worse. So there is loads to go out in here and, and we'll be hearing, I'm sure, about some of it a bit later on I mean, in, the, in the transport space, certainly things to do with electric vehicles, hydrogen potential, active travel, shared mobility, micro mobility, there's masses going on there. Um, in the building space, obviously the issues around wasted heat and energy right now are absolutely pivotal and that affects both domestic and commercial uh, buildings of all scales and sizes um, and also there are massive issues in there in terms of materials choices um, cement on its own is responsible for three percent of the world's carbon emissions so when you think about that in the context of anything we go ahead and build whether it whether it's a building whether it's you know to do with transport it could be any kind of infrastructure that is in itself also significant so we, there's an awful lot to go out in there which there isn't time to go across today but certainly conscious thinking about all of those different things could make a massive difference but the other side of the equation because all of that is really to do with the tap so the level of emissions you could actually aspire to to bring it down to the other side of it of course is around the drain if you like out of the bath which is to do with the capacity of the whole planet to cope with those with, with whatever level of emissions we end up with and that's it that's in two parts the natural systems our natural systems can cope with some of it in terms of our blue and green infrastructure and the ability we have to build those resources to work much harder for us but the other side of it is to do with innovation and technology and new ways of thinking about how we actually capture or deal with carbon dioxide once it has either escaped or is indeed caught at source, depending on what you can actually do. Um, at the moment, we have absolutely no capacity to deal with the level of emissions that we're currently generating. We are way beyond that level. So um, to rely purely on innovation and technology to get us out of this problem is utterly ridiculous. Again, bringing you back around to the issue around the, the essential need of carbon reduction with this. So, so coming to the east of England, it strikes me that this is a real, and I guess the reason I was quite keen to participate in this conversation today, um, obviously, it is a region with big plans for growth, 
and it's already a region where there are significant numbers of people who are out and about using those different infrastructure systems I've been talking about. So it strikes me there is a huge opportunity in the east of England to do things differently to support all those different things I've just been talking about and to really think about the carbon balance, the net zero balance that we could be aiming for in, in terms of the specific geography of the region. And I think alongside that, of course, we need to be thinking about the economic and the social sides of things as well, because they, they can't be disconnected. So there are enormous opportunities in here for collaboration uh, within and between regions, within and between countries. Um, these, these carbon emissions, they're pesky things, aren't they? Because they don't follow geographical boundaries. It doesn't matter where you put the line on the map, they, they all affect everybody. So other people's emissions affect, affect the east of England and east of England's emissions obviously affect everybody else as well. So it isn't something that can be solved in, in, in isolation, but it certainly is something that can be thought about in terms of actually, you know, what contribution the east of England could make to helping not only itself, I guess, but also others. Um, and on the innovation side of things, as I was just saying, I think it, it is it is reasonable to assume that we will see quite a lot of innovation in this space, whether it's to do with the energy shift or whether it's to do with the ability of, of you know, the whole system to cope with the level of emissions we end up coming to. But the point is that the burden of that offset is, is as I just said, massively beyond the current, our current ability to cope. So while there is absolutely a place for innovation and technology, and I think we should be seeking to bring that through as best we possibly can, it is not going to be okay to just leave the emissions as they are and just hope that technology will step in and, and somehow fill that gap. So I think, I mean, it's, it coming, coming around to a bit of a close there, in terms of specific policy asks, I guess, from my personal point of view, I, I think it's fairly obvious from everything I've been saying there, I think there is absolutely a need to make sure that carbon in particular, but also wider social and environmental outcomes are given a far stronger consideration when it comes to investing in any form of infrastructure or evolving and changing infrastructure going forward across, across this particular reason, region. Um, I think we need to make it quite easy to do that. Very easy to say, quite difficult to do. We need to make sure we have methods that are measurable and are able to be compared. So we know we're comparing apples and apples and not, not some weird and wonderful variety of fruit salad. Uh, I think we need to make it matter. And I think we're gonna to have to be quite brave in terms of how we go about doing that because we're going to have to say no to some things if they don't meet a particular carbon or any other benchmark. But equally, we need to understand why we're saying no and how we might adapt some of the decisions and some of the ideas in order to be able to say yes, if you see what I mean. And I think that, again, it's, these are easy things to say, but it's actually bringing through that carbon thinking in particular across these projects that could really make a difference there. And I think certainly for the East of England, I mean, at that point around measurement, understanding where as a whole region things stand now and what a net zero position could actually look like, what is possible, those are all things that actually could be thought about in quite a lot of detail right now. And we do know what we know, and we could be thinking about that with a lot more clarity if we wanted to. And of course, where it gets slightly tricky is that net zero carbon is necessarily a fixed singular point. It could, that balance could be set at different levels depending on what the strategy is for the region. The point is that it has to be a balance. The tap and the drain have to actually sort of match up. Otherwise, you know, you will not be helping, I guess, in terms of the wider endeavor. So I, I think those, those are sort of my brief thoughts, um, which hopefully serve as a useful opener. Um, and I look forward to hearing what, um, what happens over the, over the course of this debate. I'm sorry, I won't be able to stay right to the end because I've actually got another thing I've got to get on to, to do with the IC side of things in a, probably about 20 minutes or so, but uh, look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's a very, very helpful introduction to um, uh, quite a complicated set of issues. Um, I, the Environment Bill is currently going through Parliament and I sit on the committee yesterday, we had a lengthy discussion around, it, in some ways, the balance you were talking about. The government wants to introduce the term um, proportionality in any of these decisions. And of course, that's a highly subjective and contentious term. And whether it's COVID or whether these investment decisions, these are really hard decisions. And it's good that they're being discussed with politicians because in the they are political judgments. I would say that I'm delighted to see I, I'm, we're joined in addition to Melvin and Peter. Um, we've got Lord Tevin and also um, my colleague Rachel Hopkins from Luton on the call. And I suspect others will be coming in again and we'll be looking for questions and contributions in a few minutes. But I'd like to turn next to Nigel Cornwall, who's the Director of Hydrogen East. And there's a lot of excitement, I think, around hydrogen at the moment. A lot of, lot of interest, um, certainly in a range of sectors, but it's a, 
we're, we're coming, I'd say, from a perhaps some way behind on this, and I think there's a lot of catching up to do. I don't know whether Nigel would agree with that. But, um, Nigel, uh, over to you, I'm trying to find you on my screen. Um, hello there. Oh, yes, there you yeah. are. Very good. Got me? Nigel. Yeah, good, good, good morning. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, Daniel, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, Steve Barwick for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing uh, to deliver net zero um, uh, targets, uh, but particularly the role uh, we in Hydrogen East are uh, adopting to try and bring some diversity and leadership into the debate. Um, I'm going to, I've been asked to talk about three things, basically. Uh, the first is where we are today. It's, it's very easy to forget um, about the richness and diversity um, of the uh, current uh, clean energy economy in East Anglia. Uh, and I'm going to uh, also just look a little bit forward at uh, one or two of the very exciting projects that are, uh, are in the pipeline. Um, uh, and then I will say a little bit more about uh, what we are doing in, in, in Hydrogen East. We're, we're new kids on the block. Um, and um, uh, despite that, we, we've, we've made some very good early progress uh, in implementing work streams that we hope uh, can not only help the region, but also provide an exemplar uh, to other uh, parts uh, of uh, the UK. So uh, first of all, um, I guess the obvious point is that East Anglia is already an energy powerhouse. We hear references to northern powerhouses. Uh, a lot of industrial clusters are, are involved developing demonstration schemes uh, on hydrogen. Uh, but the fact is here in East Anglia, we're starting from very solid foundations indeed. Uh, we're, we're already responsible uh, for providing over a half um, of uh, national offshore uh, wind capacity. Um, uh, 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 and those are schemes that have been incrementally added and are continuing to be added uh, um, um, uh, at the moment. Um, we also, of course, um, are the landing point uh, for a, roughly a third of the GB's uh, gas supplies uh, through Bacton, which I'll uh, come back to uh, in a moment. But the environment is actually a lot more diverse than that. There are over 200 megawatts uh, of consented battery storage projects in the region. Uh, we've got uh, a reasonable uh, solar. Uh, fleet over uh, 600 megawatts um, uh, on, on large commercial sites and an awful lot of small domestic sites as well. Uh, and the region's also leading the way on energy from waste uh, and biomethane uh, injection. Uh, we do, of course, have access potentially to uh, Europe's largest uh, CO2 storage network. Uh, and last but very not least, we are also um, the home of um, the Sizewell uh, nuclear station uh, on the Suffolk coast, um, uh, which supplies about 8% of UK domestic supply already. And that's before um, the, uh, the build out um, uh, as, as hoped of Sizewell C, which had some very positive uh, indicators from government in, in, in the newspapers over the weekend. So um, a very, very solid baseline and a very profound um, uh, significance to, to, to the regional economy in terms of uh, gross value added, jobs created, uh, businesses that have uh, developed around the energy economy, and also a very strong spine of skills development, which is very important uh, looking forward. Um, and because of that, uh, our New Anglia uh, Local Enterprise Partnership uh, described um, the region as UK's clean energy region uh, in its local industrial strategy um, uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, and obviously energy 
growth and innovation is at the heart uh, of the plan uh, moving forward. Um, so that's where we are today. I haven't actually talked about hydrogen yet. Um, it was actually name checked as a possible avenue of development in the local industrial strategy, uh, but there was very little detail. Uh, that isn't a criticism of the document. I think two years ago, our level of understanding of where hydrogen was, uh, both globally and in terms of developments here in GB, was, um, was somewhat uh, uh, at the very early stages, and we've seen exponential interest in the sector uh, over uh, the last two years. Um, one of the things that struck me earlier this year when um, we formed Hydrogen East, which is myself and, and, and Jonathan Reynolds from, from, from Opogee, uh, was that despite the rich energy legacy and, and plans going forward, um, Hydrogen uh, was not at the centre of the debate uh, in the same way as it has become central in, in, in other places. Um, and that seemed to us to uh, be a missed opportunity. And I think coming back to some of uh, Rachel uh, Skinner's comments, um, there are many, many challenges now, much greater than we previously anticipated, uh, if we're to have any chance of hitting the 1.5 degree uh, pathway uh, and securing net zero uh, by uh, 2050. So that's why we formed Hydrogen East. Um, it wasn't that long ago. It was just as we went um, into the lockdown. And first of all, we looked at um, what was happening elsewhere in the UK. Uh, there, there is active interest in industrial clusters uh, in the Midlands and the north of the country. Um, but actually, one of the things we don't have here um, uh, in any great scale, obviously in East Anglia, is a large industrial demand or the big heavy industries, which are the focus of those commercialization schemes. So what we tried to do was think of what was an appropriate approach to marshal information and evidence about hydrogen and its possibilities uh, in this region. And what we did was to decide to look more closely at regional economic sectors, pockets of demand, um, not individual projects, but how we might consolidate some of those. Uh, uh, and through that, begin to draw in activity uh, and hydrogen availability from the different sources available uh, to uh, the region. Um, so it's a bottom-up strategy, uh, place-based strategy, to use one of the terms that uh, is very um, popular uh, in, in transport decarbonisation. And the challenge for us is to see how we can build scale uh, which can then be linked with emerging supply in a cost efficient way to prove that the um, activity can work in a, in, a, in a different economic context uh, and leveraging from existing energy assets and networks. So that is the concept. Um, what are we doing? Well, um, we could do an awful lot is the answer, but I think in the interests of um, moving forward and building uh, understanding, we've developed three work streams uh, and each of those uh, is, is um, progressing. Um, we only really launched at the end of July, so we're just a little bit more than three months into the journey. Um, the first project we're looking at, we're calling uh, Bacton SNS 2.0, SNS Southern North Sea. Uh, so effectively what we're trying to do is looking at the existing uh, assets um, at Bacton, uh, how they can be developed and progressively um, transition to use of hydrogen, be that from uh, the existing uh, blue hydrogen uh, that might be available from the North Sea, 
combined with storage opportunities, but also looking forward to the integration of green hydrogen as more and more offshore wind uh, uh, comes uh, to be commissioned. Um, and uh, uh, I'm delighted to say that we think we've already achieved uh, funding uh, for uh, an initial study um, uh, for that work. Um, the second work stream is a very similar concept, uh, but this time based on different technologies, different contexts down in Suffolk, looking at the region around uh, Sizewell. Um, uh, I think EDF has already mentioned that it has plans to consider development of an electrolyzer uh, connected with Sizewell B. Um, and um, it will also need to decarbonize the construction process uh, for size we'll see as and when, uh, if and when that goes ahead. So um, there is um, a, a focus of activity uh, which we can link to local developments uh, and potentially look at supplies uh, of hydrogen as it scales uh, up to the East Coast ports where there is a natural market uh, in shipping over the medium to longer term. The third project um, is, uh, it comes back to Rachel's point about behaviours uh, and, uh, uh, and how we live our lives. This is much more focused uh, on transport. Um, I completely agree that we will get nowhere near our targets unless we tackle the difficult bits around heating and transport. So what we're doing with our third work stream uh, is looking at an aggregation of activities, uh, probably in West Suffolk. We launched this uh, concept uh, last week uh, where we know some councils are looking to convert refuse uh, fleets uh, progressively uh, to uh, new fuels, including hydrogen. Uh, there are agricultural demands and food processing demands. Uh, and we're also keen to incorporate in that cluster um, a demonstration scheme that would uh, focus um, on uh, using hydrogen uh, uh, for heating uh, on a new development. And we're currently working with stakeholders in the region uh, to uh, build support for that project uh, and getting a very high level of uh, feedback um, and engagement. And then looking beyond that immediate region, there is of course opportunities for uh, swapping out diesel on the rail lines to the east of Norfolk and Suffolk. Uh, that's in national rails development plans. We're looking at use of hydrogen for use in leisure boats uh, on the broads. Uh, and also in, in, in use by boats, um, building the uh, future offshore wind fleet um, off the coast. So in conclusion, uh, these are very early days in the project. We think we've got off to uh, a flying start. Uh, there's certainly a lot of local interest. Um, we're focused on aggregating and scaling demand locally. Uh, and it's very empirical, uh, based around uh, geographical mapping and making connections that might not be obvious. Uh, we're learning as we go along, um, but so far, we, 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 as I say, we've had a high level of interest uh, and buy-in from regional stakeholders. So um, what is clear, however, um, is that um, there are real opportunities for the development of a regional hydrogen economy because of the unique access to existing and future uh, energy assets in the east of England. Um, there can be many markets that are not traditionally thought about that can be decarbonised uh, through use of hydrogen, uh, especially in agriculture, transport um, and potentially uh, uh, heating, uh, and I think it comes back to my initial point that uh, only through 
successful deployment of hydrogen will be able to hit net zero and achieve our stated aim, uh, uh, the, the regional aim of being the UK's uh, clean growth uh, region. So that's uh, all I've got to say, and I really Thanks, appreciate Nigel. the opportunity. No, that's, that's, that's really, really helpful and really pleased to hear so much work is going on. I suspect some there are going to be some questions for you in a minute. Um, I'll just reflect that um, certainly Joe Bamford has been doing a, a lot of um, parliamentary lobbying very effectively. And of course, um, he, he, he's pushing for, for signing. It. I think there's probably stuff um, further north of us as well. So it's really important yes. that, that this, this group can, um, can make the case for the East. Um, which brings me to Jonathan Cole. Um, Jonathan, um, perhaps you can give us your perspective on the power and energy situation. Jonathan. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thanks very much to all of you for being here, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, just quickly to introduce myself, so my name's Jonathan Cole. I run the offshore wind business within Iberdrola, so I look after everything we do in offshore wind globally. Uh, and that includes everything we're doing uh, within Scottish Power here in the UK, and in particular um, the, in the East Anglia region. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to just quickly cover four topics uh, this morning. I'm going to just very quickly reflect on net zero and the role of offshore wind within that. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about what we're doing within Scottish Power and, and in particular in East Anglia. I'm going to touch on some issues which are quite relevant at the moment around grid infrastructure, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how we how we move forward and, and what in particular we need to be looking out for in terms of government action. Okay, um, so starting just on net zero, I think Rachel uh, gave a very good introduction to the topic and the challenges and just how much substance there is in 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 this conversation. So I'm not going to rehearse any of that. Um, but I think one thing I'd like to, to, to touch on, I mean, Rachel's absolutely right, that net zero it means way more than just incrementally building wind farms and shutting coal plants. Uh, and we're talking about an economic and social transformation. Um, and, and there are a lot of unanswered questions about how we're going to get to net zero. But when you're undertaking a massive project like this with such importance, almost existential importance for our way of life, you can't wait until you have all the answers before you start to act. You have to act um, based on you know, what you do know at the moment. And what we do know at the moment is that renewable energy works. It can be deployed at scale and it can be deployed at a price which is cheaper than any other source of electricity now. And so an essential part of net zero has to be this process of electrification and decarbonisation. So we must electrify as much of the economy as we possibly can, how we heat our homes, how we transport ourselves, low temperature manufacturing processes, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have to produce that electricity from low carbon sources like renewable energy. Uh, and, and it's essential we get on and do that because we know we have the technology and the capability to do that right now. Um, now that of course means that offshore wind becomes highly relevant because offshore wind is probably you know, the, the lowest cost of all the large scale, low carbon generated technologies. Um, and, you know, it, offshore wind has earned its place in, in that mix because of the, the remarkable job it's done over the past 10 years in bringing the cost down to a level which is now able to, you know, win contracts from the government at below the government's own predictions on the wholesale energy price. Um, you know, since offshore wind has really cemented its capability to deliver massive quantities of reliable, clean, green, affordable electricity. Um, I have to say the UK has had a huge role globally in, in getting offshore wind to that place because it's the leadership that, that has been shown here in terms of setting the right targets and ambition in terms of putting the right policy framework in place that has allowed offshore wind to get to where it's got to. Um, and, and we really welcome the announcements recently from the Prime Minister about the, the target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And, you know, the idea that we would power every home in the UK from offshore wind by that date. So that's something that the offshore wind industry absolutely welcomes and, and, and we will deliver upon that. Um, the other great thing about offshore wind, of course, is that the economic benefits that it delivers. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot just now about this concept of the green recovery. 
in response to the, the, the coronavirus pandemic. And it makes perfect sense to stimulate, you know, these large scale infrastructure investment programs, cascading down, you know, benefits through the economy, it's creating jobs and opportunity in the areas that need it the most, whilst also addressing the issue of net zero. Um, and there's two other really interesting things that the offshore wind offers in the, you know, the, 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 this economic debate. One is diversification. So if you look at where are we investing in offshore wind, where is the money being spent, where are the jobs being created? It's not in the big cities, it's in the coastal communities and post-industrial towns that really need that investment the most. Um, and the other really interesting thing is we hear a lot um, when we talk about net zero about the concept of the just transition. So recognizing that in a net zero world, there are a lot of people who today earn the livelihoods in you know, carbon intensive industries. And we need to have a succession plan for those people. And Offshore Wind uh, offers not all of the answers, but it offers you know, such, some interesting options in terms of the redeployment of people from certain sectors like oil and gas or you know, some of the maritime sectors that will be affected um, you know, by, the, by net zero. So Offshore Wind has a big role to play. Um, the East of England has a huge role to play then in, in that um, process. Nigel's already touched on just what a contribution the East of England already makes um, to low carbon generation. If you look at that 2040 target, probably, sorry, 2030 target of 40 gigawatts, probably about a third of that is going to come from the, 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 you know, the East of England region that we're talking about here today. So it's going to be huge for the country's um, net zero targets in uh, this region. Okay, so thinking about Scottish power for a minute then, what are we doing about this? So for 20 years now, we've been living with the energy transition as at the core of our strategy. You know, as part of the Iberdrola Group, which is the leading company globally on the energy transition, Scottish power has converted itself to a company now that only produces electricity from green sources. So everything we do is consistent with the energy transition. We produce green, green electricity, we transmit and distribute it to where it's, the demand centers are, and then we sell it to customers with digital solutions. So we're right at the heart of this, embedded in this. This is within our DNA now, uh, working on this. And, and offshore wind is a core part of our plans going forward. And as I said earlier on, East Anglia is probably the jewel in the crown of our global offshore wind business. In fact, it's the reason why our global offshore wind business is headquartered here in the UK. Um, Within the East Anglia area, we're working on four huge projects that amount to about 4,000 megawatts worth of uh, offshore wind projects. We've just built the first one, East Anglia One, which is a 714 megawatt project we completed uh, over the summer. That's 10 years of development and construction activity uh, finally coming to a conclusion. Uh, there were some challenges in getting it com completed, as you can imagine, given that we were in the middle of the pandemic. But you know, it, we were providing an essential service to the economy. We had to carry on and working with our supply chain, we managed to find a safe way to do that. And so now that first phase of, the, of our East Anglia projects is producing enough power for 600,000 homes in the UK. So we're very pleased about that. Um, but you know, that East Anglia One project, I think, is a great example of what can be done locally with these types of projects. Because in the course of the past 10 years, we've invested uh, 30 million pounds in local ports in Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth, which is creating uh, opportunities for you know large and small supply chain companies. Uh, we've created 4,000 jobs during the construction phase. We've created hundreds of jobs now, which are being mobilised in Lowestoft for the next you know 20, 30 years of operation and maintenance. Um, we've invested in dozens of contracts in local suppliers. Uh, all over the East Anglian region, not just at the ports, but in Ipswich and Norwich and Colchester, etc. All, all over the region, there are contracts being won by big and small companies. And we've spent almost a million pounds on skills projects, you know, investing money in schools and colleges, um, developing STEM workshops. We've had more than 3,000 local children go through our STEM workshop programmes. So we've this project is not just about clean electricity, it's also done a huge amount for the local economy. And as I say, the great thing is that this is just the start. This is only 20% of the potential we have in the East Anglian region, because we're now working on the, the, the next set of projects, which we're calling the East Anglia Hub 
So that's more than 3,000 megawatts of projects, almost 3 million homes in the UK could be um, powered from that project. Uh, and if you imagine the, the, you know, the industrial benefit we managed to get out of East Anglia 1, just imagine what we can do with something the size and scale of East Anglia Hub. So we're hugely excited about getting on and doing that project and continuing you know, the, the good engagement that we've had locally um, in building the, in, the industry and, and, and taking advantage of these opportunities. But I think it's also important that we, that we acknowledge that there are some issues uh, in the east of England right now around offshore wind, in particular around the location of onshore infrastructure. Um, you know, the, 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 there have been uh, you know, concerns about the amount of infrastructure being uh, situated onshore uh, and criticisms of the regime that we currently work in, which, to be honest, was not designed with a 40 gigawatt or 50 gigawatt offshore wind sector in mind. It was designed with something much smaller in mind. Now, for our part, we've always tried to be very sensitive about how we tackle these topics. We've always engaged in enhanced consultation locally, um, you know, more than the, the regulations require us to do. And we've really listened to the local people. Uh, you know, we've, we've made big decisions that have cost us a lot of money, but they were the right thing to do, like undergrounding all of our cables, uh, like building the infrastructure for more than one project at once so that we minimise the amount of activity and disruption locally, uh, like taking the, the cable routes away from the public roads onto haul roads that we, we built so that we minimise disruption with local traffic, uh, you know, screening the substations to minimise the visual impact, and also trying to enhance the local infrastructure with things like flood defence schemes that actually improve the resilience to flooding in East Anglia, which is a really relevant issue. So we've always tried our best to do it sensitively. But I think it's fair to say that in the long term, uh, some change is needed to the, the, the transmission regime. Okay, And, and we, we agree with that. We agree that long term, what we need is a strategically planned offshore wind network which has got better interconnection between the offshore zones, better resilience, less onshore connection points, et cetera. We totally agree with that. But, but one thing I think we also have to recognise is that it will take several years to get the regulations for that in place, and then several years to design that network, and then several years to start to implement it. And we cannot stop with the offshore wind programme for all of those years until we have this sorted out. If we do that, Offshore wind will grind to a halt. We will cripple supply chain investment. We will lose thousands of jobs in the supply chain, and we can forget about our, our net zero targets and our you know, 2030 targets. So I think it's really important that we keep going sensitively with the the you know the 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 the, the regime we have, but as quickly as we can, we get the succession regime in place, the long term regime in place. And we need to all work very carefully, industry and, and government, to see that that happens in a way that doesn't derail all the good work that's already been done, but that we stay sensitive to the local communities. Okay. Um, so the final thank thing is just to, to touch you. on the, the successes that we've had in, in East Anglia. I think a lot of the success has come from the, the level of local support. We've had some great success from parliamentarians like Peter Aldous. We had a fantastic support from groups like the East of England Energy Group and the New Anglia LEP, who've really done a great job of encouraging you know, advocacy and collaboration across the industry, not just offshore wind, but all the energy sectors of the East of England. Um, and I, and I, you know, we really want to see that continue. We, you, East of England has something really special there with those groups that it should cherish and nurture. Um, I think looking forward, there are more opportunities to accrue even more benefits in the local area. Uh, you know, the ongoing conversion from oil and gas supply chain into this new um, offshore wind supply chain to create a long-term succession plan, attracting new players, new investors into the east of England because it's the area where most activity is going to be in offshore wind more than any other part of the UK and also trying to get investment into ports. And that's going to be really important if you really want to get the supply chain um, you know, maximised, is to get the right level of port infrastructure investment. And the Prime Minister did announce, when he announced the 40 gigawatt target, a port infrastructure investment fund, 150 million to start with. And I think it's really important that, that you know, the ports in East of England get themselves organised as quickly as possible to try to access that funding. 
you know, otherwise, what do we need from government? I think the energy white paper, which is coming in the next month or so, is going to be critical to setting out the path to net zero. And we really need to get as many answers or as clear processes as possible in that white paper. Uh, we need to keep the, the, the current framework we have, the CFD mechanism, is a great way to keep costs down. It's now buying offshore wind electricity at lower than the wholesale market price. So it's not subsidizing, it's just giving a stable price and that's helping to attract investment and drive costs down. So we want to keep that in place for the long term. Um, we need clearer signals to invest in the grid. There's been some a lot of really unfortunate distractions right now from Ofgem about how they are going to uh, encourage investment in grid infrastructure that's threatening that. And if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't get fixed, everything we're trying to do with offshore wind will be jeopardized because we won't have the onshore grid network to take the power where it's needed. And as I said, we need to encourage port investment. That's how the UK really gets the type of supply chain uh, investment that it, that it wants is investing in ports. So that's the key things going forward. So net zero is a- is Thanks, a, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Sorry, I'm overrun. That's, okay, that's, no problem. That's, no, it's a, a, a stoppable torrent of ideas, which is great, okay. which is exactly what we need. Um, thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, now, we've got a few minutes for, for contributions and questions, but first of all, I, I would like to bring in my colleague, Peter. Um, uh, there, there are fewer weird places than, than Lowest Oft and Yarmouth in my, in my um, experience, and Peter's a real expert on these issues. So, Peter, if, if you'd like to, to come in first, and others who wish to either question or contribution, either wave or, or, or put a, a note in the chat. Thanks, Peter. And you're very many thanks for that. And thanks to Rachel, Nigel and Jonathan for setting the scene. And I think they've highlighted the scale of the opportunity and the challenge. And actually, we're not just talking about East, the East of England being a regional exemplar in a UK context. We, we can play a very major world, a, 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 a very major role in a global role. Um, you know, if we look, the, Scot um, the um, East Anglia hub project is an enormous project. Hydrogen, we've, as you said, it's a, it's a new kid on the block, but we have the opportunity for pink, green and blue hydrogen. And we've also got representatives of size we'll see um, on the um, on the, on the show this morning, um, the we do, as I said, it's an enormous opportunity, and I just fear that we haven't yet got that properly on the radar in Westminster. And I think just there are two issues we need to highlight. These in the, on their own, we're dealing with some enormous projects, but put to put together, it's you know it's. It's, a, well, it's incredibly large, and we need to think in that strategic role. We need government to be aware that of the opportunities we have here compared to other regions. And we also, that infrastructure, that um, the grid and everything, we need to get that right. There are, you know, a number of my colleagues perhaps at times think, oh, offshore wind opportunities in power stations, that only benefits places like Lowestoft and Yarmouth. Actually, it benefits the whole region. And we do need to try to get everyone recognising that and working together. I could go on all day, but I think this APPG has a very important role in making, in bringing us together and making our voice heard here down in Westminster. Uh, thanks, Peter. I mean, what was striking listening to all three speakers was uh, that that question of, of of who leads this and who makes it happen. And I think Jonathan was perhaps um, hinting at some of that. Now uh, it goes beyond um, a particular, perhaps local authority or local grouping. I don't know whether there's anyone um, on call who wants wants to come in and and make an observation on that. But it does does feel to me that when it's part of the role of this group, I suspect because there's a bit of a gap. We can't do it, but we can perhaps point to what needs to be done. I don't know whether Nigel or Jonathan would have a view on that. Um, I certainly think there has to be a good 
360 degree look around how the existing system can be transitioned because I don't personally see and I agree with Jonathan that the nature of the challenges from the scale of offshore growth that is possible can be accommodated against the current baseline. There was a very good report produced yesterday by Policy Exchange setting out some uh, institutional and regulatory recommendations uh, which look sensible but they need to be put firmly in front of government and local stakeholders should be seen to stand behind them. John? Yeah, so I, I think what, what I would encourage is that, you know, with a coordinated voice, this group, you know, tries to make clear in Westminster its support for these net zero programmes, offshore wind, hydrogen, you know, nuclear, but whatever it is that, 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 that you know, that, that you want to advocate for. I, I, and then try to work with government to find the concessions that will be needed to get the programme off and running. I, I mean, I think at the moment, uh, as we can see, there's a lot of distraction because it's quite easy to find problems that will emerge in the early years of, of implementing this net zero programme. And what we need to, I think, show is the right attitude to proactively work together straight away and solve those problems as we go and not hold things back. So I, I, mean, I, I think that the benefits are clear for, for all of you guys to see. And, and I think we need to keep that in mind and keep kind of a, a very positive engagement and a very kind of solution oriented engagement to all of this. And you have the commitment, I think, from everyone in the private sector and the industry to work with you to, to deliver that as well. Jonathan, because ask you, you've got a, 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 an overview of what's happening around the UK. Are, are there other regions that are doing things differently, better? Um, what could we learn from what other people are doing? Or is there no pattern? No, I, 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 I really do think that the east of England is, is one of the best coordinated regions, in, certainly in England. I, I think what you might find is in Scotland, they tend to be quite coordinated because of the yeah. You know the, the 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 constitutional and, and government set up there, but um, but if, if you compare the east of England to other parts of England, th th this is the region I think that a has the most to offer, you know, in terms of hydrogen, offshore wind, nuclear, gas, local infrastructure, etc., um, and also has the best coordination. So I would encourage you to use the strength you have with those, that existing coordination and the fact that you're ticking so many of the net zero boxes to, to, to you know, keep moving. Very good. Any other people that want to come in and ask a question or contribute? I um, can't see in the chat. I'm vaguely looking to see blue hands and I'm not seeing them. Um, so perhaps find one final point just to you, Nigel. Um, I, I, I'm encouraged by what John just said, but I'm still not entirely clear who leads, who makes it happen. And we seem to have a plethora of organisations sometimes. Is that a problem or just am I, am I worrying about things we need to worry no, about? No, it, it is a big problem. As Jonathan very clearly explained, the existing developments and those that will roll through till 2025 will effectively be done under the current baseline. That does not allow cross-sectoral development in the North Sea, um, which is clearly where we're heading. And the regime that currently is in place, the so-called OFTO regime, took five years to develop between 2009 and 2014. So, you know, there needs to be a catalyst uh, and, and a focused campaign. Um, there's a lot of thoughts flying around, but somebody needs to pull them together and put them in front of Bayes uh, and uh, Ofgem because we have too many uh, fragmented jurisdictions. And when you look offshore, you've got the Crown Estate, you've got OGA, um, and, and effectively where we're heading, in my view, is some kind of coordinated North Sea grid that, that looks across technologies, uh, and somebody needs to start pushing that idea. 
um, in my opinion. Great, thanks. I think what I'm hearing is that um, I think we've got plenty of material um, that we could perhaps ask Steve to put in a letter to the Energy Minister, um, who um, it assures me is, is well on side with this. Um, but I think it would be good to, to get that from the APPG and possibly um, publicise the fact that there is a, a coordinated push going on. So that's extremely helpful. Thank you very much, particularly to both you, Daniel and Jonathan, for your um, very, very I'm helpful to, contributions this morning. I'm happy to do that, Daniel, and I'll obviously liaise with Nigel and Jonathan and uh, yourselves about the detailed content of that. Okay. Perfect. Very good. Thank you. Well, thanks for that. I think that's a really really useful and helpful discussion. Um, uh, needless to say, um, my ears always prick up when there's lots of jobs involved. And I do think, you know, when people sometimes ask the question, what are the jobs going to be? Well, there's a massive job in making this transformation. And I think some of those points were picked up by Rachel at the beginning, beginning of the discussion. But making sure we've got the right people with the right skills, um, it does require a plan. And I think that's probably uh, where we're trying to get to. So great, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Peter um, to go to deal with slightly um, more pressing, perhaps, but um, very, very important issue of how we can respond to the, the current challenge around COVID. So Peter, over to you. I think I'll, I'll leave you at that point. Then, everyone, thank you very much for for, for inviting me. Thanks, along Jonathan. Been great thank you. To you all. Thank you. Daniel, very many thanks for that, and that was a very interesting first session. I think to a large degree, the two are interlinked, because we do, um, FDR talked about build, build, build out of a previous depression, and we have the opportunity to build, build, build on our coast and just off our coast. But I think just looking at the immediate future, there is a spending review. Uh, I, think it, I, think, I think it's still going ahead, uh, albeit for one year rather than three years. And the East of England LGA have put together um, a, a strong representation. And I'm delighted to start off with that the leader of um, the, the, the chair of the East of England LGA, Councillor Lindsay Hasey, and also the Chief Executive, Professor Cheryl, Cheryl Davenport, they're just going to take us through that submission, which was attached to the papers to, um, to, to, um, to this meeting. And we did also include our, the key regional asks in our letter to Steve Barclay, which hopefully we'll receive a response to very shortly. So um, over, over to you, um, Linda and Cheryl, to outline what you, the representations you've, been made, you've made. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And um, we're delighted to be here again. And that was a very fascinating uh, introduction uh, on the net zero carbon. Um, <clears throat> and there was so much in it, obviously, that we need to take forward as an organization for the East of England. Um, absolutely amazing and very, very interesting. And, and thank you for putting this all together, really. I suppose from an East of England local government point of view, um, it's all changed, but then again, not a lot has all changed, really. We're, we're you know, we've, we've, as a local government organisations and local authorities, we've had to work through the last six, seven months um, in very difficult circumstances. Um, and now we're about to start on it again. And I, we need to be very sure that our economies and our businesses can survive. Um, <clears throat> But also it is making sure that our residents are able to uh, survive as well, because I know that a number of them uh, are finding it uh, very tough out there, both financially, but also in terms of physical and mental health. And that is a role that we local authorities must take forward. So as you said, we have um, attached to this presentation um, detailed asks of uh, government for the East of England, um, and Cheryl will take you through some of the highlights of that, uh, not the whole thing, that's why we gave you the documentation in detail beforehand, um, so that you can, so that we can just point out the areas that we believe are most important to the region. Um, so COVID is still with us, uh, we ran uh, a number of se uh, seminars. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Could, could Owen put the slides up for us, please? Yes. Thank you. 
Sorry, I did this the other, the other night because um, I've got my slides here so I can see my slides, but you obviously can't see my slides. So I've gone through that slide. May I have the next slide, please? So building on the work that we have already presented to you, um, we have put together, we put together another number of webinars covering a, a range of topics. Um, and from that, we have uh, created the documents that you have seen, but also going forward um, in terms of how we want to work with our communities, um, and most importantly, as I've said, the economic recovery for the East of England. So Cheryl, are you? Can you take over, please? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you today. Um, I think firstly, just to uh, build on what Linda said about our programme over the summer, we ran a series of um, inquiry workshops around key themes, one on economic recovery, one on people and communities, and one on uh, new ways of working. And we've produced a report from that work, which has informed our CSR submission. And what we're going to present to you today is, is a very small subset of the economic recovery asks that are in that report, asks of government. It is so important that we maintain that medium term vision and look ahead to improved economic conditions and improved growth. We are in danger of lost opportunities to build uh, back if we don't keep moving with a solid strategy for economic recovery. Uh, so, you know, the things that we've seen through the pandemic uh, have informed our recovery approach. Uh, we've taken stock of some of the things that uh, were planned and how those should move forward in the new world. Good example of this might be, you know, the current reduction in passenger numbers, uh, which will resolve over time. We can use this period for essential road and rail maintenance as well as the time to plan for the infrastructure we need going forward. So in, in the report that we've produced, which will be published shortly, there are about 118 areas um, that we want to prioritise as a region. This work was done by local government in conjunction with the public sector and private sector partners. And a large range of those can be done by the sector itself and its partners in the region. But there were about 48 asks of government across the three themes. So in the slides that I'm just going to take you through now, um, here is a selection of some of those asks. Uh, and I'd really like to emphasize that collaboration with all sectors, uh, including the private sector, is absolutely key to this work. So here on this first slide, we looked at a couple of areas. Uh, rural broadband infrastructure. So what would investment look like for the East of England and what would it provide in terms of a good return on investment? We've looked at the increased uh, working from home and remotely uh, since the pandemic. The fact that businesses and the public sector now have an increased reliance on digital offers and, and, and customer services digitally and also linked to the presentations this morning air quality improvements experienced during the pandemic wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be maintained and would be reversed if we didn't actually get ahead of our, our broadband infrastructure investment. So that's a key area for all of the parts of, of our region to benefit from. We also looked at um, the deficit sustained by councils uh, and the impact of COVID clearly a big uh, issue here in terms of the baseline of funding into councils and the need to maintain critical services as well as plan for the future. And without that, uh, we cannot get on top of tackling inequalities and levelling up, and we can't meet uh, joint priorities with key partners such as the NHS and others if, if we're not uh, sustainable as councils in the medium term. So if we just go to the next slide, thank you. The longer term funding settlement for local government clearly is a top priority too. We understand the position with the one year CSR, but uh, we wanted to reinforce the point here uh, that investment in councils and in prevention uh, has a huge benefit to both uh, public sector council uh, services, but wider services for society and costs for society. Keeping that transformation in the medium term is really important for councils and that, that horizon of being able to plan over one financial year is, is essential for that. 
The next area on this slide looks at the way we use community assets, including retail space. Uh, so if, if retail stands empty, we cannot collect the business rates. And also the longer that asset stands empty, the more difficult it is to maintain it and make it ready for future use and the more costly that might be. So uh, how we uh, plan our places and spaces uh, in place shaping terms is absolutely essential in the medium term as part of our economic recovery. If we go to the next slide, please. So coming back to the issue of ports, which was mentioned earlier, um, the ambition is to achieve at least one free port in the east of England. Um, if this doesn't happen, there will be significant supply chain concerns for the UK as a whole. I think it's really important to note the, uh, the status of those ports, with 40% of UK goods coming in via the three haven ports, including Ipswich, Harwich, Harwich and Felixstowe. Um, so it's essential for the East of England to have at least one free port and to have that as a top priority. And then um, the final one on this slide, it looks at the um, agile and remote working by default. Uh, now there's, there's, there's pros and cons, of course, to remote working, but there are some absolute benefits that we don't want to lose uh, following the changes that have been made. Hybrid working, uh, the opportunity to uh, have an impact on, on carbon reduction, and um, the opportunity to make the best of skills and jobs and employment in an agile culture of employment. As I mentioned earlier, these are just some of the economic recovery asks that we have, and the main report lists all 48 under the three themes, and there are many others under the economic recovery theme that we haven't uh, covered here today. If we go to the next slide, please. So just to touch on the next steps, the recovery plan uh, of which the CSR submission has been uh, informed by will become a formal submission to the East of England APPG. So that will be a, a document uh, which, which goes into much more detail than these slides today. We will be looking for that continued collaboration across public and private sector. And th there is a comms and lobbying plan in progress for this recovery report. And we wanted to engage you in that in that early stage today to say that advocacy from our regional MPs uh, is, is a key part of that lobbying and comms activity. Our, our plan is to give you consistent uh, materials uh, and target those activities with you where these messages can consistently be, be passed on and the the narrative about the East of England and its strength in economic recovery can then be reinforced at, at all opportunity. My final point uh, today is to say that economic recovery is fundamental to our national and regional uh, position. It has a lasting impact on the quality of life and outcomes for people, communities and society as a whole. And that's why as, as a sector and with our partners, we have spent the summer thinking about these important issues and getting ready for this next period of investment and growth. Thank you very much. Very, very many, very many thanks for that, um, Linda and Cheryl. And I think we will quickly go on. We've highlighted the important, the, um, you've highlighted the importance of getting that East of England ask and our voice heard in Westminster. And as an APPG and as MPs, Daniel and I and everyone else in the region will help with that. But I think there is, I think institutionally perhaps our area has not Bit perhaps had as loud a voice as it as it should have done, and I think that our next speaker is Greg McClymont, who is executive director of IFM Investors, um, who is just going I think sort of set out a few more ideas as to how we could get greater coordination um, from different organisations, both public and private, um, in and in the third sector in as a regional advocate. So government and Whitehall really do sit up and take notice of the East of England. So Greg, look forward to hearing from you. Many thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. I guess to begin by just saying how delighted I am to hear 
uh, to speak just after Cheryl and Linda, because this is exactly what IFM is interested in, is, is trying to find a way to contribute uh, to the building of an effective regional voice for the East of England, as per really, I guess, Daniel's questions at the end of the last session. How does one create that? I would just say a little bit IFM, um, which is quite an unusual institution in some ways. IFM owns or part owns Anglian Water and Stansted Airport. 2006, we, we took a stake in Anglian Water. In 2013, in Manchester Airport's group. And IFM is a, an investment manager which is owned by pension funds and invests on behalf of pension funds. Uh, in the UK and around the world, we've got more than 50 UK pension funds who invest with IFM and more than 450 pension funds around the world. And the advantage of that, the opportunity it gives IFM is to genuinely take a long term perspective on investment in infrastructure. Of course, we hear a lot, don't we, um, about long term ism and the, the necessity of investing long term and taking a long term view of everything. But events often intervene and make that more difficult. The structure of IFM, the ownership by pension funds and the investment on behalf of pension funds with long dated liabilities do give us the opportunity to really take a long term view. And it's that long term view which has led us in, in the last couple of years to, to really try and do our bit and um, to, to encourage um, and put in place uh, a voice for the East of England. And as I say, there's nothing more happening than, than just hearing the previous presentation, because that's exactly the, the kind of thing we have been keen to see at IFM. So in a, some senses, it's a, it's a, that's fantastic. It sounds like the job is beginning to be done uh, by the region and you're really putting that voice together and we're keen to help further with that. Just some background, we published in February 2020 uh, an economic strategy for the East of England. Uh, where IFM commissioned Cambridge Economics, you know, to really do an in-depth study um, of, the, of the East of England economic potential. Happy to share that with anyone if, if they don't have that report from February. Around the same time, we also commissioned um, a report on West Anglian mainline improvements, because from a Stansted Airport point of view, um, really important is a critical part of the East of England's economic infrastructure that the best possible surface access, to use the jargon, essentially the real link into the airport, um, is as effective as possible. And long term, we're really keen to see that um, happen. And the, the, the plan was produced, again, happy to share it, really concretely sets out step by step what could be done um, to improve the West Anglia main line, to reduce congestion and make it a more efficient and effective service. And in the Anglian waterfront, um, I think there's a real opportunity, Peter, to take it to your COVID recovery um, perspective, that, that water companies in Anglian in this instance um, already have a series of long-term infrastructure investment plans, which could easily be brought forward or quite easily brought forward with government consent, you know, to really start to drive that build back better policy emphasis. The plans are already there. It's just a question of getting agreement from government that the money can be spent inside or outside the regulatory settlement. So again, that's a concrete area where we're in discussions at the angling water level uh, as an asset with, with government. And that brings me probably to, to my final point and just taking it back to the context. It seems to me coming in from, from the outside, I've only been at IFM four months now uh, and was previously a politician amongst other things. And wearing a politician's hat, as, as certain people in this call, you know, are doing actively on an everyday basis. One notices that the, you know, the, the Northern Powerhouse and the Midland Engine have, you know, have that institutional organisation, which enables them, I, I see from my perspective, to get that voice in a bit more efficiently and quickly and and a, a universal basis to, to government. And really, we're keen, just as long-term investors in the east of England, to see that political voice, small p political voice, emerge to support the east of England. And we've been having conversations over the summer with lots of different uh, individuals representing lets and local authorities across the east of England to try and nudge that along. 
And as I say, the work that's been done by, by the East of England Local Government Association just sounds wonderful from our point of view of really trying to harness that energy in the East of England um, you know, to make those representations to government uh, with one voice. So I'll finish by saying in answer to, I guess, Daniel's question, which he posed 10 or 15 minutes ago, who can provide that voice? It can't be IFM because we are just an, an investor on behalf of pension funds, but we are very keen to support uh, the attempts to deliver um, you know, that institutional voice. And I say our, our approach over the last two years has been to try and nurture um, conversations and dialogue between the different entities in the East of England with a view to making representations to, to the Treasury in particular. Um, so we're here to help. We have a genuinely long-term view based on pension fund ownership and investment and anything we can do to help the, the APTG uh, and the institutions of the East of England um, you know, be even more successful, we're, we're here to do. Thank you. Greg, very, very many <clears throat> thanks for that. And I should mention that before the next meeting on the 9th of December, Daniel and, Daniel and I and Steve do have a meeting with Greg to talk further about how and work up some plans of how we can get the region's voice more clearly heard and we'll report back at that at that meeting now any any can I, any observations and questions on the on the on on what we've heard from Lin, linda Cheryl, and greg um i'm looking around for any hands up or um any Wait, frantic waving of hands or messages in the in the group chat. Um, Speaker Charlie Kitchen here. I have I have raised. No, it's my good hand. to hear from you. Yeah. I didn't. I don't know if it's appeared. I just got a comment about um, the point that was made about rural broadband, as you uh, you might expect me to. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Charles Kitchen. I work for City Fibre. We're currently installing full fibre networks in a number of towns and cities across the region. Uh, just to let you know, we're also looking. A uh, piece of work about how we expand those city boundaries to get into the more rural areas um, and there's a piece of work going on at the moment so I'm hoping that um, you know in the years to come we will be able to contribute to um, getting fibre to all of those the, the rural areas um, predominantly of course Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, Cambridge is very rural so we're, we're currently you know working in um, in Lower Stoughton, Cambridge as uh, Peter and Daniel will know um, but also sort of Ipswich, Bury, South End um, and other, other places. So, um, and, th and that's great for, for also supporting what we were talking about this more, um, earlier on around the low carbon economy as well. So I think, you know, the more people that can work from home, it, it contributes to uh, that sort of um, net carbon reduction. So that's just to share that with the group that um, part of the COVID-19 um, recovery in a number of the cities are including the work that uh, uh, City Fibre and other fibre companies are doing to uh, help people work from home and uh, to, to get the economy going again. Charles, very many thanks for that. And indeed, the investment you're making in Lowestoft is, is very welcome. But I think the nature of our region with medium medium sized towns and cities and market towns interspersed with very large rural areas does present challenges with regard to broadband connections and it is vital we meet those challenges and thus the the fact that that was number one on the lga's um list i think speaks for itself um further comments people anyone anyone <laughs> any of yes linda you want to come back yeah thank you i mean i think one of the other things that we need to 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 take that forward is to ensure that any new developments any new housing built automatically has full fiber into the premises and there is no quibble because it's a utility these days um, and I think that's uh, we as politicians we need to make sure that uh, the developers understand that and the developers need to understand that actually residents have to have it particularly as we all know people are going to start working more from home and developers are now saying well we, we, we won't build three bedrooms we'll build two bedrooms and the third bedroom now becomes your office so I mean I think there is uh, we we have to make sure that that point is taken on board across uh, developers and planners. Many thanks many thanks Linda for that that very worthwhile and appropriate correct observation there. Um, 
further further comments, anyone? Peter, I was sorry, Steve. Um, yeah, just from the Secretariat, I just wanted to say the next meeting, the last meeting of um, this momentous year. Uh, it's scheduled for the 9th of December uh, at 10 o'clock, 10, same time, 10 till 11.30. And I think the idea is to try and do three things. Um, so the first thing is to look at what the spending review uh, actually has resulted in and where we are in terms of both the letter that uh, the APPG sent to uh, Steve Barclay and also obviously the EELGA um uh, input uh, and of course you know anything else that emerges of relevance from uh, the spending review for other businesses and organizations that's the first thing second thing is um, we obviously will report back on that outcome of that meeting about uh, improving regional advocacy uh, and then the third thing is we will put forward I think subject to obviously the agreement of uh, the MPs um, a program of meetings will basically be discussing what is it that we really need to be looking at and thinking about in 2021 so uh, that was the schedule i think for the meeting in december i hope that helps everybody and is something that we can put in your diary you can put in your diary and we can have a good discussion then okay steve many thanks for summarizing that and i think that's um a, you know a sensible very sensible way forward. And I think I would just add from um, looking into 2021, um, it is very important that we get input from all our partner organizations, from the business sectors, from the councils, from the third sector, right across the region. But I think it's also important we hear from other parliamentarians in the region as well. So we will over the, you know, it's it's great to have um, Lord, Lord Tebbit here. And we've also had strong representations um, from Luton as well here. But it's, I think, need to need to reach out right across to all other MPs to hear their views and aspirations. So we are very much all working together. So that will be something that we do aim, that we do very much, I think, aim for in, in 2021. Um, just looking around for final comments from anyone. I think on that basis, I will um, conclude. I will thank our five, six speakers for their very, um, their very important contributions for them, for highlighting some, some very important issues the opportunities, that, very exciting opportunities that we face that we in front of us in the long term, that it's important that we do um, grasp, and also some very, very serious challenges that we face in the short term. Also, special thanks to our sponsors and to um, Steve and his team at De Devo Connect, who act as act as our secretariat. I think we have agreed that we will um, be writing to Minister Kwasi Kwarteng, the Energy Minister, to highlight those opportunities in the, uh, um, the move towards zero carbon and the, 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 the vital importance that we think strategically across the region so as to make the most of the opportunities. And already, I think, supplemented our representation of the LG, LGA's representation of our own letter on the review of Steve Barclay. So th those will be items that we will discuss next time. But I want to thank all of you for your participation and attendance today. It's greatly appreciated. Um, we couldn't work without you. And I think this very, very important region, we need to make our voice heard and you're helping us do that. Thank you very much indeed. Have a rest of the day and best of luck everyone for the lockdown. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Daniel. Bye now.